Welcome to another video by your friend, Matthew. Today I'm going to be reading from Spinoza's Ethics, a dense and complicated book, but nevertheless an important book in the history of Western philosophy. And the fifth part is my favorite of the book, the last part. Um, it's called Of the Power of the Intellect. And I'm going to read a tiny passage from this part. Proposition 6. Insofar as the mind understands all things as necessary, so far has it greater power over the effects or suffers less from them. The mind understands all things to be necessary and determined by an infinite chain of causes to existence and action, and therefore so far enables itself to suffer less from the effects which arise from these things and to be less affected towards them. The more this knowledge that things are necessary is applied to individual things which we imagine more distinctly and more vividly, the greater is this power of the mind over the effects, a fact to which experience also testifies. For we see that sorrow for the loss of anything good is diminished if the person who has lost it considers that it could not by any possibility have been preserved. So also we see that nobody pities an infant, an infant because it does not know how to speak, walk, or reason, and live so many years not conscious, as it were, of itself. But if a number of human beings were born adult, and only a few here and there were born infants, everyone would pity the infants, because we should then consider infancy not as a thing natural and necessary, but as a defect or fault of nature. Many other facts of a similar kind we might observe. Forgive me if you can hear the wind outside. It's like whistling and howling, even though it's a nice, clear, sunny day. So, Spinoza is famous for his idea of infinite substance. And he was a pantheist, so he believed that God is infinite being and, you know, his pantheism is sometimes criticized as promoting this like closed system of the universe. And because it's kind of perceived as a closed system, he is seen as a determinist, where everything is determined already. And everything is completely necessary in the way that he puts it in that passage there. And so nothing could be other than what it is. And because of that, seemingly, there's not really any room for any sort of free will or freedom of choice or something if everything is determined in kind of a closed system that is the infinite substance of God. And, you know, his ideas about God, I, maybe I'll have another video about that sometime he lays out his whole philosophy in that book in a very systematic way in kind of the tradition of like geom geometry, geometrical proofs and stuff. And I like how focused he is and how airtight he tries to make his system. Um, but as somebody who sympathizes more with 
like an open system model or process philosophy um, where, you know, in, in most process philosophy, the past obviously is set in stone, but the future is not. And so it's an open system in that way because there's always new creation. There's always novelty. Um, and so in that way, process philosophy is not deterministic or mechanistic. And I like that. I, I lean more that way. But what's fascinating is that that last part of Spinoza's book is a lot of it is about like the freedom of mind, which seems kind of paradoxical to his system in some ways, right? And so that passage I read is basically about, as you heard, um, by using our rationality or something, by cultivating and practicing the use of our rationality we can have more freedom of mind. And in that passage, he says that we can have the, the freedom of mind to that allows us to not suffer so much from any given thing, whether it's loss or anything that we wish wasn't the way it is. He's saying that if we see it as necessary, if we see it, if we see that it cannot be other than it is, then that can relieve us from suffering. You know, so there's there's almost like a Buddhist touch there, accepting things as they are, um, and not clinging to a fantasy about how they could be or might be or whatever. Um, so, I mean, the passage is kind of a blend between his like closed system determinism saying nothing can be other than it is. Everything is the way that it is in a completely necessary way. Um, but he's also bringing in this notion of freedom of mind in the face of that. So for human beings, we have the freedom of mind to kind of almost c at least halfway control how much we suffer. So, I mean, I, I agree with the freedom of mind thing and I find it ironic and paradoxical in a system and I, and I still, um, need to make more sense of how he brings those two, two things together. I mean, I, I guess I do understand it, but it's, it also just, it does seem ironic. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it kind of relates to ideas of karma, I guess, you know, if we think about karma as the law of cause and effect. And so everything in the past has unfolded based on karma, based on cause and effect processes and relationships and we have the type of consciousness that can either perpetuate karma in our own lives and you know karma isn't always bad even though we usually think of karma as like bad karma or something or that's just his karma you know um but yeah so like in our own individual lives we have patterns and habits that we perpetuate and so our karma becomes kind of often automatic because we're just um, kind of locked in the same patterns but I think with freedom of mind we can untangle ourselves from patterns that don't serve us, right? And we can create new patterns. And so that's why I like that passage. I hope you enjoyed. 
If you did, go check out other videos in the Reading Aloud series that I started. You can also check out my podcast on my channel. It's called Infinite Weird, where I have conversations with interesting folks about their spirituality or lack thereof. And you can also check out my videos on spirituality and philosophy. I got a play playlist called that, as well as videos on the tarot cards, mainly the major arcana. So until next time, peace.